right. Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is May 16th, 2022, and I call this meeting to order. Um, just a quick update on licensing. Um, I won't bury the lead today. We're going to be issuing our first operating license. Um, it's a social equity applicant um, in a small outdoor cultivator. Uh, I know many people out there were hoping we'd issue more by now, um, and we share that uh, concern, um, that feeling, but um, it's, I think at least relevant to put me, put this moment in, into a little bit of context. Um, when I started down the road of tax and regulate back in 2015, the goal um, was to get up and running by issuing um, licenses exclusively to dispensaries. Um, this was the model at the time around the country, and it still largely is. Um, Vermont really has charted a different path forward. Um, you know, when we were appointed a little over a year ago, issuing licenses in 2022, um, let alone May of 2022, felt like an impossibility. Um, you know, the Cannabis Board is a new um, independent agency. It's not under the umbrella of a larger agency. Um, they could give us things like computers or a place to work or any of the kind of basic IT or HR support. You know, we really had to build um, this agency from the ground up. And I know I'm a broken record on this point, but, you know, the legislature was supposed to give us our staff and approve our basic market structure last year. Um, we were supposed to hire these people. Um, and build our regulatory structure with them last year and um, essentially have the entirety of the table set for May 1st. Um, but the early delays in passing Act 164 um, snowballed into delays in appointing the board members, um, appointing our advisory committee, missing the 2021 legislative session, and hiring um, our executive director. Um, and of course, there's always a tension um, in government between doing things in the open with public support and doing things quickly. Um, from the beginning, the board really recognized that the only way we were going to build trust um, and the rules that we needed was um, to embrace the open meeting laws, to be, have an open and honest dialogue with the public. Um, since our first meeting last May, We've held over 150 public meetings. Um, I think we set the record with respect to adopting our rules. Um, and yet we did so with a tremendous amount of public input and advice. Um, we now have a functional licensing portal that's getting better every day. We've pre-qualified, I think, over 100 applicants. Um, and today we're going to be issuing the first Vermont legal cannabis business. So this is not a victory lap, but I would like to take a brief moment to acknowledge the incredible work of our staff. You know, making up for these delays has always been a top priority of the board, but it's come at a real personal cost to our staff um, who've ignored their families, postponed taking time off, spent many sleepless nights thinking about canopy sizes and insurance requirements, um, certainly cashed in all their favors with uh, our partners and government and with the legislature and with family members. Um, and really, a lot of the problems that we face um, as a cannabis board are unsolvable um, and at times intractable because of the federal status um, and the enduring stigma associated with cannabis. You know, working here at the board just means you have to embrace that and wake up every day with the attitude that we're going to give it our best shot. So thank you to the original cannabis team, um, Nellie, David, Kimberly. Thank you to the medical team, Meredith, Melissa, and Lindsay. Thank you to our new recruits, um, Carolyn, Alexis, and Dominique, and um, Julie, Kyle, thank you. Um, you've all really shown um, a lot of persistence and patience, resilience, and conviction. And you're all a lot of fun to work with. <laughs> um, and I know, Julie, you keep looking over at Bryn. <laughs> Bryn, all I can say is, where would we be without you? You really are the heart and soul of the Cannabis Board. You're a leader, a strategist, our therapist, our spiritual advisor, <laughs> and our best friend. If you go back and watch the debate around Act 164, 
the legislature didn't want to spend any money on the board before it started gener generating revenue. So they combined about six positions into one, um, into the executive director. And when I was appointed, um, I created a list of people that I thought could pull it off. Um, it was a short list, um, an extremely short list, but Bryn, you are at the very top. So, you know, I'm very grateful for you that you said yes. I'm grateful for all the sacrifices you made. Um, I'm grateful that you've never keyed my car when you pass it in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, you're always here before me and I always leave before you. So maybe it's just a coincidence. <laughs> anyway, um, we are, you know, just taking a brief moment to acknowledge the staff, but we are getting back to work to approve more licenses. You know, in issuing licenses, um, the board needs to balance um, the urgency that we all feel with the need for transparency. Um, so our plan is to pr approve licenses during our regular meetings. However, if we get to a critical mass at any given time, we may decide to call a special meeting to approve those licenses. Um, we will do so in compliance with the open meeting laws and give 24 hours notice. Um, and when we do approve an application, we will notify the applicant by email um, the instructions on how to download your license and your establishment ID card will be contained in the email. Um, we will also update our website um, with the business name, the license type, the tier, the general location, and the priority status of the licensee. Um, we've been fielding a lot of questions about where in the pipeline each individual applicant is. And I recognize there's a lot of anxiety about getting your license, um, but, um, and do feel free to call or email us with your questions, but please just keep in mind that each inquiry um, slows down our team in issuing licenses. We have guidance on our website on how we're reviewing applications. We are prioritizing social equity and economic empowerment candidates and the current dispensaries as the statute requires us to do. Um, and then we will turn towards general applications in the order that they were submitted. If you call us and ask where you stand in the queue, we can't give you any greater detail than that. Um, and we will be in touch directly with you um, either when your application is complete, um, if it is incomplete, what information we need from you, and um, you know when it's appropriate for you to reach out to CSI. So that's it on licensing. Um, I'll just give a very brief legislative update. Um, you know, our two kind of policy priority bills did pass both chambers of the house. They didn't pass in the exact form that we asked, um, but they were combined kind of in a legislative maneuver. Um, in the waning days into a single bill. It's S-188. Um, you can find it on the legislative website. It's an important bill. It does some really uh, critical things for leveling the playing field between small cultivators and you know, larger companies. Um, there's a lot of issues around consumer safety and public safety that are addressed. And it does things um, you know, that increase the functionality of the market. Um, but it didn't do concentrates. Uh, you know, they didn't lift the cap on the high THC solid concentrates. Um, they did ask for a report back from the Cannabis Control Board about the impact of leaving that cap in place. And so this issue is still alive and will be debated next year. Um, fire safety, I mentioned a few times, fire safety needs to talk to every prospective licensee, whether you're kind of a retailer or product manufacturer, or you're an outdoor cultivator. Um, they've done some internal reorganization uh, at fire safety, and now all cannabis inquiries should run through just Land and Wheeler, whether you're North or South. It's Land and Wheeler, Land and Dot Wheeler at Vermont.gov, or his cell phone is 802. 216-0501. Um, inventory tracking, I know that this is um, an issue that people are um, focused on. So it's a very important part of the regulated market. Um, it protects the in industry from federal enforcement, protects licensees from being undercut by illegal inversion, and it helps the board prioritize our compliance resources. 
And I know I've mentioned it a few times, but the three major companies um, that have occupied the space in almost every adult use state have some serious downsides to them. Um, and the last thing that the board wants to do is to enter into a long-term contract and uh, force the industry to kind of learn the system and devote the human capital to, to kind of mastering it and then have to change. Um, you know, Washington State, for instance, has had to change three different times um, because they were unsatisfied with uh, their inventory tracking systems. And every time it caused major disruptions to the supply chain. Um, we're trying to avoid some of those mistakes. Uh, with respect to an update, though, um, you know, any big IT project requires that we follow some strict rules around procurement. Um, we have our scope of work drafted for inventory tracking. It's being reviewed and approved by all of the right people currently um, and will subsequently be put out to bid. Um, until we have a contract, I can't give too much specificity as to the exact parameters of what will be required. However, conceptually, um, you will be required to keep records of your inventory, including all sources of seeds and clones, acquisitions, sales, transfers, harvests, um, applicators, testing, disposals. Um, you can do this on your own, um, or you can do it using a third-party inventory tracking platform. Um, you'll have to share these records with the board on a regular basis, and we will be analyzing them internally and conducting regular site visits based on our analysis. This is the model that's being used in a growing number of states as the industry starts to move away from the kind of big three heritage systems. Um, I'll continue to pro provide updates where possible, but please know that every licensee is required by law and by rule to track your inventory, and we will be requesting those records. Um, other than that, I uh, just need to approve the minutes from our last meeting on May 9th. You guys had a chance to review them? Mm -hmm. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. The next on our agenda is to review staff recommendations on pre-qualification and licensure. Okay, so. We have our pre-qualification and license register for today. Um, I will go through it, but as a reminder, as I mentioned last week, all of these numbers um, that you'll see in the charts are current as of last Friday. Um, so some of these numbers may have changed slightly by, um, by today. So you'll see that the board has before it today 36 pre-qualification applications up for review and approval. Um, we have really plowed through the cultivator pre-qualification applications. You've already approved a little bit over 100 of them. Um, so today we are primarily going to be looking at retail, um, manufacturing, and wholesale <clears throat> pre-qualification applications. So I'm going to jump in to our list for today. So um, again, all of these applicants have demonstrated compliance. Um, they've been reviewed by staff. Their applications have been deemed sufficient um, to meet the requirements of rules 1.41 and 1.42, and therefore have been found to be suitable, suitable for pre-qualification. So I'll jump right in. Um, by submission number, we've got 106B, um, applicant for a tier two manufacturing license. Submission 106C, um, retail license. Submission 149B, tier two manufacturing. Submission 149C, retail. Submission 156B, tier three manufacturing. Submission 156C, wholesale. Submission 6B, retail. Submission 155, tier two manufacturing. Submission 39, retail. Submission 538, retail. Submission 55, retail. Submission 74, tier two manufacturing. Submission 142, wholesale. Submission 142B, retail. 
submission 238 retail, submission 469 tier two manufacturing, submission 290 retail, submission 169B tier two manufacturing, submission 1B tier two manufacturing, submission 269 retail, submission 302 wholesale, submission 319 tier two manufacturing, submission 320 retail, submission 322 retail, submission 26B retail, <clears throat> submission 291 tier three manufacturing, submission 291B retail, submission 281B retail, submission 490 tier two manufacturing, submission 505 retail, submission 35 retail, submission 75 retail, submission 312 tier two, tier one mixed use cultivator, submission number 350 tier one outdoor cultivator, submission 369 retail, and submission number 253 retail. And a reminder when there's a, um, when the submission number is followed by a, a letter, that's because that applicant has submitted a pre-qualification application for another license type. So those 36 applicants are um, recommended by staff for board approval for pre-qualification. And I will keep going. So if you'd like, because we've got something else, we have two other things to approve on the register today. So if you'd like to approve everything as a package, we can go through everything first. So as the chair mentioned here, we do have one license application for review today, recommended by staff for licensure. But we'll take a look first at the application numbers. <clears throat> so you can see that um, we have sent out about um, 25 incomplete letters uh, to outdoor and indoor small cultivators. So that means that those applications have been reviewed by staff, deemed to be incomplete, and staff has prepared um, a letter indicating to the applicant what they need to um, what they need to submit in order to have a complete application for the board to review. So we have one staff recommendation for a cannabis establishment license. Um, so that's our that is our first applicant up for review by the board. So this business, um, Rutland Craft Cannabis Limited, is has demonstrated compliance with our application requirements for all license types and also those specific requirements for cultivators, subject to the waiver provisions that are set out in Rule 1.18. So they that what that means is they've demonstrated compliance with Rules 1.4 and 1.5 and they have been deemed suitable for licensure by staff. So um, you can see here the business name. This is all information that the chair indicated would be public on the website. Business name, it's an indoor tier one small cultivator. Um, the location is Brandon, Vermont, and they, are, um, they have been deemed to be a social equity applicant by the board. And lastly, we have another um, Submission number for up for review for social equity status. And then also you can see our social equity numbers up here. Um, got 10 in submitted and received status. We have three social equity license applications currently under review. Um, 29 have been deemed incomplete. And we have um, one pending board review, which is right here. So um, this applicant has met the criteria for social equity individual applicant as set out in the rule as they meet the definition of a socially disadvantaged individual as defined in rule 1.1.3Q. Um, and the staff is recommending that this submission number be approved for social equity status. All right. Well, um, David, do you wanna help us with a motion or have you done that? I think you can reuse the motion that you've been using for each of these, yes. Okay. 
Do you want me to read the motion? Sure. Okay. I move that the board accept the recommendations for pre-qualification, social equity status, and, and licensing approval as presented to us by staff. Second. Any discussion? I'll downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. All right. Well, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All right. And so um, these folks will be notified. Um, the person with the operating license and Brandon will uh, be able to download um, his license and his ID card and um, begin operating. I feel like parliamentary procedure doesn't give you an opportunity to like celebrate small moments of joy. <laughs> but this is kind of a small moment of joy. Like when you were talking about work, like this is a heavy lift. Like we had all these policy ideas and then our staff made them operational reality. And that's just that. And we had a number of people who spent a lot of time with us. And that's a gift. Like the fact that the public was willing to spend that amount of time and be that vulnerable and share that much personal information is a huge gift. Um, so I just want to appreciate all of that. Second. <laughs> yeah. No, I totally agree. I've said it a few times now, but I know very little about cultivating cannabis. Um, and, you know, there's, we could have gone down one of a hundred different ways to get to where we are. And uh, this, this one feels like the right one. We wouldn't have found this path without the support of the public. Yeah, looking back a year ago, I think at this time a year ago, we were still trying to get cell phones or I was trying to figure out how to create a website because I don't think people <laughs> realize that, that all of that work was done by us yeah. for the most part. So big year, big moment. We'll turn out more, hopefully full applicant licenses in the coming weeks too. So. Other states started with small amounts and then it gets, you know, there yeah. becomes more of a routine. Just but it's a lot of work and there's more to do. So it's, you know. All right, well, um, why don't we turn to public comment? Um, if you uh, have joined via the link, please raise your virtual hand. We'll try and call on you in the order you raise your hands and then we'll move to people that join via the phone. So if you have a comment, feel free to go ahead and raise your hand. Dave. Hey, congratulations on uh, Big First Step. Very uh, proud of all of you, all the work you guys have done. You should be proud of it. Um, it's, uh, it was a lot. Um, I was wondering whether it might be possible for the board to, um, I don't know, act as a clearinghouse or, uh, or, or provide uh, contacts between different um, parts of the supply chain uh, as folks are pre-qualified, uh, for example, I have clients who are uh, retailers uh, who would love to start conversations with pre-qualified growers. Um, so to the extent that the board can can help uh, the market with that sort of connectivity, uh, I think it would be uh, much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Next, we have uh, Red Clover, I think, Analytics. Red Clover, regardless. <laughs> yes, Red Clover Analytics. Previously, we were THC Analytics, um, but we you know, changed our names, banking. They're really finicky about names. Um, but nonetheless, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, okay, yes. good. Um, nonetheless, I want to thank you for all the work you have been doing. This is great. And uh, I used to do group development before I started doing this. And one of the things I used to say is uh, it, it's uh, celebrate even small victories because celebrating small victories gives your team that that um, uh, um, to keep going and, and desire to to uh, see if they go through. Um, but anyhow, uh, the other thing I was asking is, um, uh, are we going to see any type of uh, updates on, on the side of medical? Um, it just, uh, since you guys merged, uh, I, I personally haven't heard much from that end of things. And um, no, curiosity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, organics.
OK Organics, can you, uh, do you have a comment? If so, unmute yourself. Nelly, why don't we keep going and we'll move back if uh, OK uh, joins like us. a spider web right here, all I can see. <laughs> Sure. Um, that is all for uh, focus. Oh, wait, we have one more. Anne. Good morning. I am calling you from beautiful Arizona, and I just wanted to congratulate your team. I've worked in 15 state processes, and I've never seen one with such transparency. And um, truly appreciate what you have all put together there. So thank you for being such leaders in the industry. Thanks, Anne. So if you've joined via phone, um, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six and we'll try and. Okay. Um, yeah. And we have a couple more folks. OK Organics did manage to unmute themselves. OK, thanks, Nelly. Hi, sorry, it was not working with me. Um, this is Greta with OK Organics. Um, I have applied to be a tier one outdoor cultivator. And um, I'm just getting a little concerned at the pace of things, um, given that we really need to be able to get plants in the ground. Um, so I, I would like a little guidance on on how to move forward, um, not having a license yet when really it's time to plant. Um, I've invested a lot of money and now I'm concerned that I'm not even going to be um, able to grow this year. Um, and then two, about the whole background check thing, I never received a response to my email from three weeks ago. Um, I would just like clarification as to why you can't accept the FBI check if I've already had it done and it's in my possession and I am willing to give that to you as a background check. Um, I understand that, that you couldn't contract with them. Um, but back in March, that was the guidance. It was to go through the FBI and the state, which I've done both of. Um, and I really don't understand why those cannot be accepted. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Greta. Next, we have Sean LaRock. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the uh, time out to hear the comments. Uh, as much as you all can just impress upon the legislature that the solid THC caps are going to do nothing other than perpetuate the black market and even cause, you know, a, essentially another vape crisis as manufacturers potentially look to add terpenes, other cannabinoids or any other item that could be dissolved into that concentrate to produce a product that now comes under the 60%. And I don't really understand why liquid manufacturers are getting a pass on it when that was a large part of uh, the crisis of you know, additives, uh, high potency THC that seems to be uh, a mental health crisis, or at least what other folks are chiming back in on the caps about. And maybe there could be a workaround that if you're producing concentrates above 60%, that there should be a minimal amount of CBD as part of that test result rather than just an entirely THC based product. And if that would be a, a compromise that the legislature would be willing to go for. Uh, thank you very much. Next is Tito. Hi, everybody. I hope you're all having a great day. Uh, I just wanted to express my disappointment that the THC caps uh, didn't get removed coming out of the legislature. And I just want to emphasize the importance of getting this changed as soon as possible. So if that has to, you know, if it has to wait now till the next legislative session, then just, we just got to make sure that this uh, stays in the conversation because it really is devastating. It's it's really like just eliminating 50% of the revenue for retailers, it, it feels like. Um, but uh, that's it. Thank you all. Thanks, Tito. Jared. Yes, I'd, I'd like to second the uh, comment from the caller that said she was concerned about getting plants in the ground. I'd like you to uh, consider prioritizing growers 
for up for okay. approval because if you don't get the growers approved, the dispensaries won't have much to dispense come October. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Bernardo. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, I just wanted to commend you guys on your work. I've seen this process roll out in other states, and I have to say the transparency you provided to the public is like unmatched, um, especially with regard to pushing for small cultivators and small producers in general. Um, I will not be joining the market because of the THC cap. And so far, I've spoken to six people who I think they want to pull their license applications. But I'm curious. Um, I just have a suggestion, curiosity. I know this might be written in the legislature or not. But does the board have, uh, is the board allowed to decide what products are disposed in cartridges? To my understanding, uh, solid concentrates have a cap on them, liquid concentrates do not, but they have to be disp dispensed in cartridges. Is there a workaway workaround for that? Um, the cartridges themselves, because of the product being put inside the cartridge, there's essentially 122% tax, right? That's 30% cannabis tax, 92% vape tax. So if, as a producer, I sell a $25 vape cart to a store, the store wants to sell it for 50, the consumer pays $110, $111. And <clears throat> so if liquid concentrates <clears throat> were not susceptible to THC caps, but were eligible to be sold in jars as opposed to cartridges, that would be awesome. <laughs> and uh, I just wanna second the speaker who discussed the vape crisis that was a vape crisis of cartridges. Cartridges being imported from China, containing lead and all sorts of metals in them. People just putting whatever they wanted in those cartridges because taxes for them were so high in the white market. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a real problem for this market. I myself as a producer was ready to do manufacturing for over 15 different, um, hopeful producers coming into the market. And now aside from trimming, packaging, edibles making, they're not able to turn over a majority of their harvest to a small production lab in order to have faster turnaround. When you consider the uh, home occupancy growers only being allowed to hire one employee, that's a lot of work uh, for them to maximize their value and they're not able to offset that work to anyone. I mean, they are, but I don't know who's gonna open a trimming facility because it's not really worth it. Anyways, I know it's not your fault. I think you guys are doing a great job. I just want to give you some bullets to take to the legislature. Um, thank you. Thanks, Bernardo. Hey, Hi, <laughs> hi everybody. Um, thank you for everything you guys are doing. Um, I had one comment that I was um, hoping, we are deep in our packaging and we want to make sure that somehow we know that they're, all the packaging requirements are done and completed on your documentation that you guys have um, versus starting and, you know, it's very costly to change packaging. So I'm wondering if there's some way of knowing that from you guys. Also, um, if it's possible to get visual examples, um, so there's no misunderstanding of your copy that you've written, um, if you'll be adding any visual examples of, of how things are supposed to be presented on packaging. That's it, thank you so much. Thanks, Tara. Jason. Hi, uh, thank you. I just wanted some clarification on the application process about whether the um, applicants listed on like a tier one small uh, cultivator application need to apply for employee ID cards or if that's kind of happens automatically with the application. Because for one of the two applicants, it wouldn't let me put in an, an employee ID card application, um, but the other one, it, it's saying, 
it was redundant that it was already in the system, one of two of us. Okay, thanks, Jason. Ezra. Uh, I'm Ezra. I don't know if this, there's more than one Ezra, but I'm happy to share a comment. Um, I think it's you. Yeah. Thanks. So I uh, am a licensing consultant uh, in Massachusetts and a social equity applicant down here. And I too have been just so relieved to see Vermont approach this from a more realistic uh, perspective in terms of entry into the market. Uh, you know, a tier one of a thousand square feet is really going to keep local operators um, participating. And, you know, for example, in Connecticut, a tier one is 10,000 square feet. So uh, it just, and they also are trying to do social equity, but um, to make the industry uh, more clearly kind of resemble what it already is. A lot of individual growers um, have about a thousand square feet. And so to, to make that tier one, I just think is a really excellent idea to keep the industry local in, in Vermont. So, so that's fantastic. And I just look forward to it uh, coming online. Thank you. Thanks, Ezra. Anyone else either by video or by phone? Jesse just raised their hand. Hello. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Actually, this is uh, this is Shane uh, McFarland with Old Growth Organics. Um, I just wanted to touch base and first. We uh. We lost you. I don't know if you turn off your video. It might it might help the connection. Um, is there a bad connection? Yeah. I apologize. Uh, is this better? Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, I had posted a public comment the other day online, um, and I just wanted to reinforce it a little bit. I had, um, and I know we're far, far past this at this point, but it's worth noting for the future. Um, just the uh, the outdoor plant canopy, um, and then the correlating plant cow. Um, and I, I had met, you know, I, I was doing my research uh, a couple weeks back and um, looking into the plant count aspect because I, I've been growing large outdoor plants for some time. I don't do small um, in rows. I don't do light deprivation, any of that sort. Um, and then when I read in the laws or the le uh, regulations or what, whatnot that it has to be under eight square feet in order to be considered for a plant count, right? So I was excited to be able to do tier one, 125 plant, plant count or whatnot. But I feel like keeping it to an eight square foot per plant kind of negates the idea of a plant count at all, being that, you know, square footage suggests that it can be unlimited plants, you know, so then having the ability to choose, all right, I choose 125 plants instead, but it needs to be eight square feet. I would have to plant a plant in, you know, the end of June and then, you know, let it go right into flower and it would still be it would still be bigger than eight feet. So um, there's that. And then, you know, obviously to piggyback on some of the other people, obviously, you know, there's nothing we can do now, but the, um, you know, the illegality in the black market is going to flourish with the whole concentrate debacle. Um, you guys all know this, not trying to beat a dead horse, just figured I'd throw it in there. And, um, you know, just joining with everyone else and the obvious concern of the amount of money invested, the properties purchased and all the things and needing to get licenses, um, you know, and, Obviously, you guys are doing absolutely everything in your power. I applaud you. I just, you know, I don't join in very often, so I figured I'd throw in my two cents. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else for public comment? You're on the phone. You can hit star six to unmute yourself. All right, well, I'll close the public comment window. Just a few comments um, in response. Um, 
the things we can answer. Um, the board uh, will share whatever contact information about licensees that they kind of agree to other than what we've done already. So we can look into maybe sharing contact information if, if someone gives us approval to do so. Uh, medical, um, you know, there was a medical bill uh, this year. It didn't get a hearing. Um, we, you know, the new rules are up. People can apply for medical licenses if they'd like to. Um, um, and if there's suggestions about the future of the program, the board, you know, will will probably be looking into that issue and, and creating a new legislative proposal on that. Um, the federal ID check, um, the kind of you go to the post office or the sheriff's office and get your own uh, fingerprints. That specifically is not permitted to issue a license um, using those federal ID checks. The process that was spelled out in our statute is slightly different. Uh, and that uh, is through the Vermont Center for Crime Information or Crime Information Center. So we can't issue a license based upon that federal ID check. Um, solid concentrates. Yeah, I mean, we hear you. Uh, the legislature, I think, actually started to come around to the idea that a regulated product is better than having the black market or the illicit market supply that demand. Um, they want alternatives to just list lifting the cap. They want to see what can we do to kind of protect youth, to protect low information consumers. Um, how, how can we educate them about high THC concentrates before they lift the cap? So, you know, the Senate voted twice unanimously to lift the cap. The House um, they didn't feel comfortable with just lifting the cap. They wanted something else. So they've given us the task of creating a report about um, the impact of leaving that cap in place. It's due December 1st uh, of this year. Um, so we'll be holding a series of kind of public meetings about that um, where people can weigh in. Um, but really, if you weigh in, feel free to you know focus on what the alternative uh, can be to lifting the cap, because I think you know, people have caught on that, that the illicit market will continue to supply those and do so using dangerous products. Um, packaging, um, we do have a packaging approval process. You know, I would like to see a system similar to Oregon where they do have pictures of approved packaging. They've got the model numbers. They have the place where you can order it from. So, you know, our, our goal is to have a running list of approved packages. If you don't want to go out and order, you know, bulk packaging before you know whether it's going to be approved, you know, you can send the board uh, a request um, to approve the packaging in advance. So uh, I think that's I would just say hold those requests right now. We're kind of working on some processes on how to do that in a more formal way so that your request doesn't kind of get lost in the hundreds and hundreds of emails that uh, our team gets <laughs> throughout yeah. the week. So. I think we've been waiting as a board until some of the packaging language that's been moving through the legislature was a little bit, you know, further towards the finish line. But we are working on guidance and a and a waiver process if you do have de minimis amounts of plastic in a in a package material that you want to use. We have packaging and labeling because the other part of that question was about labeling. So we yeah. that's on its way. Yeah, yeah. and there is yeah. those high depth pictures of everything needed um, yeah. on our website yeah. from a a warning perspective. Yeah. And then with respect to the employee ID card, Bryn, do you want to just um, explain that a little bit? Sure. <clears throat> so the employee ID cards, um, they there will be a separate application for employee ID cards that's separate from the cannabis establishment ID card that you get once you've been licensed. So if you do have employees or an, are anticipating having employees, you will have to um, fill out a separate application for those individuals. And we set it up that way for a number of reasons, um, but one of which is that we are going to allow for employees to apply for their own employee ID card in addition to allowing um, an employer to apply for that uh, employee ID card for their employees. So it will be a separate process um, and we will have the details of that process available to everybody as they as all the licenses are issued, we will make the information about how to apply for an employee ID card available. But if you are um, licensed to operate and you're a sole proprietorship, if you've been screened, um, does does that individual need a separate employee ID card? No. So the 
the way that our rules are structured, you have to have um, a cannabis establishment ID card if you are um, a principal or an owner of a cannabis establishment. And that essentially um, fulfills the same function as an employee ID card. So if you're a sole proprietor and you are licensed and you have your cannabis establishment ID card, you do not need to also have an employee ID card. Okay. Um, we're at the end of our agenda. Any other? Just want to clarify something that you said about the FBI, that that's the FBI's rule and not right. a Vermont rule that's or right. a CCB rule. So it's not one that we have control over. It's, it's right on work. their website. Yeah, the employee yeah. ID check, the kind of go to your post office or sheriff's office and get your own fingerprint support background check is not sufficient for licensure. That's a federal rule. We can't waive that. So that's why we're going through the process that we are. Um, all right, any other comments before we... I think, I think just very quickly on, on the response to, I believe it was Shane um, or Jesse, Jesse and Shane, all growth organics, you know, certainly recognize how different grow methodologies might make that box that's outlined for plant counts, um, you know, tough to to prevent mold and stuff like that. We we get that. I think we had to put some parameters around that to make sure that those folks could still be tied to the definition of small cultivator in our authorizing legislation. But we got a, a bunch of well-qualified candidates for our compliance director position and a bunch of well-qualified candidates for our compliance enforcement staff. And I think they're going to help us figure out what's the right way to interpret some of that language to accommodate the folks, depending on how they like to, to grow outside. So bear with us. Can I just Shane. add one thing to what you were saying? Everything you said was correct, but I think one helpful way to think about it is that everybody has to get cannabis establishment identification cards. The difference is that if you are a principal or owner or controller, you will get that upon gaining your cannabis establishment license. Employees also need cannabis establishment identification cards, and there will be a separate process for getting that after, you know, after licensing has happened. So it's sort of all the same thing. It's just that if you're one of those people who is part of the application, you just get it when you get your license. Thanks for that clarification. Um, any other comments before we adjourn? We're working as quickly as we can and appreciate everybody for bearing with us. Great. All right. Well, then um, we will adjourn. Thank you all. Um, and we'll see you next week.